Uh, so we'll, yeah. we'll, uh, we'll keep going in a sec, but let me just um, say that uh, we're still having issues with um, Josh's uh, audio, um, but uh, so he's going to communicate through chat and maybe Brenton can, can man the chat for us if, if uh, he or anybody else has something. But I just wanted to reiterate that one thing that he said was um, he appreciated my reading the comments, but there's one thing that I I, I blew past or, or didn't go into depth, so I want to make sure I cover that, which was, um, he said, in reading um, uh, what I read out about the chat comments, that I left off his main suggestions, which were to match bottom-up outreach with top-down. So to go through OPC, uh, 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 natural resources, Cali PA, secretaries, and get them to department heads. So, so his suggestion was, in addition to this sort of staff level kind of bottom up, also try working at the top level uh, down of our various uh, uh, loci of management uh, in the state for the coastal zone. So that's a that's a good one. Um, uh, so great. OK, cool. Let me turn to this and pick up where we were. Um, OK, so uh, what we're hoping to achieve by you know, tomorrow afternoon or, or thereabouts uh, is here. Let me kill this light. Can you just kill this light? Okay. Um, is uh, obviously today we're just getting to start up introductions, get everybody um, understanding what we're doing. Um, start to do a little bit of brainstorming about our initial conditions, and we'll define what I mean by that in a second. Um, in sort of our general charge, and we've already been having that conversation. That's great. We want to keep having those, but making sure we're we're on track with the general. Um, Trajectory of where we're trying to go for the coming uh, weeks and months and year or so. Um, and then in the afternoon, we're really going to uh, we'll start this, and hopefully, some uh, like Pete and folks that are just here uh, uh, for both in the morning um, or so uh, will maybe hopefully be able to uh, contribute to that a bit. Um, but then um, we will uh, log off our, our colleagues that are in Zoom, and then the rest of the day will just be, just be in the room here so that. Um, have more face-to-face -face conversations, um, but that's not to exclude anybody online, but, but to really sort of dig into more of this out of time um, uh, brainstorming of what, what, what uh, dimensions we would really like to look at, and that we would begin to refine what some of our sub-working groups will be focusing on in the coming weeks. So we're not all going to be working on everything all the time, right? We're going to sort of have some directed um, pieces of the, of the pie that we'll be focusing on. And then tonight uh, we will treat to have beers and and and, uh, uh, and wine and and, and non-alcoholic stuff. I don't want to I don't want to bother with the drinks. I don't want to drink. <laughs> <laughs> I get in trouble all the time. It used to be fine. Now it's like, oh my god, how dare you bloody old drink? Um, but uh, help, help with some of this discussion. So the whole hope is this evening. Um, you know, one of the main reasons of doing these face-to-face -face things is so we can formally chat. We can we can um, you know. Dr. Beckett, as she claims she's going to retire again. I think I've been very hearing her say this for a while. I also want to catch up with our friends and everything, but also really some of those things we can dig down into um, about things that are bugging us or, or, or whatever um, in, in more of that informal uh, Sean, setting. Sean, if we didn't drink, we wouldn't be doing this as long as we have. <laughs> That's true. I agree. It's a, it's a total survival mechanism. I completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, let me just make sure that I was that I've been sharing the slides. Maybe I've not been sharing the slides. Let me make sure this is. Uh, uh, oh, I gotta close this guy. Okay. Okay. So that, that that's that's where we are. So um so. We're going to roll into talking about a few more things here, and then I'll hand it off to Rich. We'll get started talking about some of the definitions. Some of this might be totally obvious to all of us, but again, just so that we're all on the same page, um, we're here doing this. We're worried about out of kind mitigation and, and, and compensatory mitigation and these types of things um, because of the, the pace and the scale of degraded outright destruction and or degradation of our of our coastal ecosystems. At the same time. Um, we are uh, uh, aware of the increased interest in um, sort of broad-based protection targets. The most conspicuous one at the moment is the 30 by the, the, the state's 30 by 30 plan, which um, might be going beyond no net loss, right? It might be trying to take us to some better places depending on the system that we're talking about. 
in terms of hitting this 30% protection target um, by uh, 2030. Uh, and then um, the, the also, as several of us have touched on, the, the growing understanding that it's not just about stuff being whacked, um, but it's also about things that might have been episodic or uh, um, a pulse disturbance historically are seen either are now or are very likely to become in the future more of a continuous press type of disturbance, whether that's temperature uh, stressors, um, uh, uh, physical disturbance from storms or uh, things of that nature. Um, and, uh, and, and this growing importance of these types of approaches for management broadly written, not just necessarily for a direct uh, assault or a direct um, specific uh, nexus of, of problems. Um, in general, we have uh, uh, this palette of potential locations where we might do um, these, these, uh, these management actions, the historic structures, the traditional functioning, um, all of that stuff. Um, uh, we are finding uh, limitations with right now, or we're worried that we'll find more limitations uh, going on into the future. So that's why we're we're concerned about these these issues. Um, obviously, this is this is a few miles from us. This is uh, Faria Beach in Ventura County, and this is um, unfortunately a, a routine situation. And I think sandy beaches are perhaps one of the classic examples of of this idea, right? And so. So this should be a uh, dune and, and, and coastal strand complex. Instead, we have houses up to a seawall, and at high tide, there is no, um, in effect, there is no intertidal uh, here. Um, and then uh, the whole coastal squeeze idea, right? So this is, these are, this is Newport, this is uh, uh, um, uh, Orange County, um, uh, San Diego on the bottom, uh, San Luis Obispo, and we all know this, right? We're, we're, we're getting this coastal squeeze. Our systems are being squeezed with development and terrestrial stressors from the, the terrestrial side of things, sea level rise, et cetera, from the ocean, um, making the potential habitat with things like salt marshes, et cetera, um, uh, precarious to say the least. A lot of work is suggesting that we're um, starting to see some sh either are, are seeing now or will soon be seeing more uh, shifts in functioning. This is an example of um, uh, larval development and metabolism that, that seem to be shifting for some fish. And uh, same thing with structure, that we seem to be, um, uh, again, either having lost structure now or on the precipice of losing more structure as we go on into the future. So all these things are reasons why just, just replicating the, what we used to have in, in location X, maybe that's not the right approach. So we need these um, these out of kind tools. And so what we're um, thinking, and, and so before I hand it off to Rich for definitions, love to uh, make sure that we're okay with this um, um, big idea, because this, this is really big for how we're, we're thinking of going for the rest of the summer. Um, and so if we do have problems, I'd like to have this conversation um, now and or when we start our initial conversation, but this is how we've been thinking about it. So um, we're proposing an overall framework for how we deal with um, uh, out of kind mitigation guidance. That framework is composed of, of components or themes, maybe productivity, something of that nature. And then those components would have uh, operationalized metrics that we would actually go and, and that would be the thing we would um, you know, directly uh, assess or, or sample in the, in the real world. Um, and so this, this sort of uh, layered approach, this nested approach, um, is how we want, want to go forward. Um, we're thinking that we'll, we don't want to um, so much focus heavily on the framework at this point, uh, nor the metrics at this point. We really want to focus on the components uh, as we begin to get into this. So, so the sort of core themes that we want to make sure we, we touch upon. And that um, over the course of the summer um, would be a place where we start to flesh these out and maybe get more of these, more of these metrics in. With, um, with the overall framework, how we pull those, you know, is, 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 a, is a component, is productivity okay to have? If we have that, is that enough to guide our, our, our compensatory mitigation? Or is it the kind of thing we need, we need at least five components or something of that nature? And so that discussion seems, is very important. It seems like we, we need to have some of these components articulated first before we go into either this sort of fine scale version or the sort of overarching how we will deploy that component of, of, of um, mitigation. Okay. Um, so 
on the question, yeah. and, and you mentioned maybe you're going to talk about this, is so obviously there's been, there's a ton of stuff that's already been done out there, right? Yeah. Like, and so um, have you, is part of the process sort of a, kind of a synthesis or review of the existing, or have you already done that piece, right? Like, so the various, you know, mitigation guidelines documents or the, like type conversion that you and I, or the you know EPA guidance documents on uh, mitigation, right? And so, so what's has that been done? Is that the first step in the process? Like the, kind of that synthesis of like where are we starting from on these coastal um, resources? I don't think it's been done. Yeah. I mean, not for this project. Yeah. yeah. So that's like a first. Yeah. Step. So I think that you know right now our goal is to identify the components. Mm -hmm. So whatever we know about those things would just go into this, and then over the summer we'll flush them out, and then that's one of the things that the students can help us with is like pulling together all the support for each of these components. So we're hoping that we are pretty comprehensive now. It might be that some of the components that we identify now are not ending up being and we're, you know, we're brainstorming. Right, yeah. So it might be some of them are things that we decide don't pan out and are not really worth pursuing. Um, it might be some of them are like, there's tons and tons of information that's really, really well established. So, you know, it could be a whole range of things. And then we would, over the summer, we would go in and then backfill in all that information. Yeah, yeah. I'm taking all the work that Stacy did for you. Can I ask another question? Mm -hmm. Please. So, yeah. So are we talking when we have a task specifically? How far in are we talking with respect to that? Uh, that's a great well, question. We have it in the definition slide. Go ahead. <laughs> 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 Take it away. <laughs> well, well and, and maybe the scope before we do that one, are we talking all mitigation or do we want to stick to that compensatory or out of kind? I mean, yeah, so compensatory for sure. Mm -hmm. And I would say out of kind and offsite are the ones that are the most problematic. So like we could, there is no doubt that in kind, offsite or in, on site, still lots and lots of yeah. work and lots of things that we could talk about and yeah. try to clarify, but we identify out of kind and offsite as being the elements for, for which there's not really good policy already. Yeah. Policy guidance. And, and, and for which different because of that, different agencies or even the same agency, different areas or whatever, maybe goes one way on this place and one way on the other. So they try to bring some consistency to that. And that'll help narrow down the components to ones right. that are most relevant to them. Maybe. And then one other element that um, is not really uh, we haven't really identified, although we do have a slide a little bit about it, is that when we talk about mitigation, we often just naturally think, I often naturally think about habitat, mm -hmm. um, but we're not restricting ourselves to habitats, and so we talk a little bit about it. So Brendan in particular was talking about endangered species, but you know, it could be it could be other sorts of things as well. And Becky talked about you know, fish in the open ocean, and so that's not a habitat disruption thing, it's really a species disruption thing. Mm -hmm. And so that is still within our scope. And, and I have some, uh, I have a, a little thing which um, is at the home back of our um, agenda, I think, but just sort of some principles, and, and especially for t today in this sort of this brainstorming thing, um, uh, Christine's comments are totally well taken, but I think we also want to sort of cast a very wide net today, right? So we want to, we don't want to be overly uh, uh, constraining, because we want to get all this, like, what about this, and what about that, and, and then you know, our task after after today is to sort of kind of narrow those down and what's practical and realistic. But I guess I would say at this point, don't don't throw things out necessarily. Um, well, let us hear them. Let's, let's throw them up on the board so we at least have them captured. Um, and, and then we can talk about uh, that. Um, Sean, real quick. Oh, sorry. Did Josh just, <clears throat> excuse me, Josh just signed off, but he, uh, last comment, I like the phased approach. I like the breadth and the expertise in age, career stage represented. I appreciate being involved. You're welcome. Uh, you're back. You just signed back on. Um, I'm sorry for the audio issues on my side. Multiple cameras are fun. I'll be signing off at 11, but I intend to stay involved. Thanks for the invitation. 
Awesome. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it. Um, sorry, sorry for the, your audio thing, too, but, uh, but all good. We're looking forward to it. It's going to be great. Um, so next we have, uh, sorry, unless there was other comments. Yeah, so good. I'll just say one thing. So I, I did actually bring the 2008 mitigation rule to the comment nice. today, just because we're, we are going to get into definitions, and I think it's important. And I certainly don't want to say this rule is like the one ring to rule them all or to unite them all. <laughs> but what's, what's, what I find good about this rule, it's tougher, um, and in fact, it's, I think the process of being revisited, um, is that there's a lot of flexibility in here. And the drivers, which I think will be palatable to all and perhaps preferable, is that when, you, when it comes to identifying compensatory mitigation, we want to cite ultimately that's environmentally preferable or ecologically preferable. Um, and so there are soft preferences in here for things like, if you look through here, there's a clear nod to mitigation banks. And then the next one is into the B programs, and then it's going to be this cross mitigation. But what they tell you is, if you have, if you go through sort of the factors, like the watershed or the regional perspective and identifying, um, and then the, the landscape and all that, you can pick one or over another that you think is environmentally preferable and even sustainable. And so I think these resonate with everybody. So there, there are, um, I think it's going to be useful. I think the point of looking at the guidelines or the, or the regulations to, like, where are those differences and how do we address those? Sure. Um, so you can be our mitigation control referee. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so I actually thought about sending the mitigation rule out as we did for this group at our time, but I thought that was a little, it's pretty big. It's hard, yeah. it gets hard to get through, so I decided that was a little bit too much. But I agree, I think it's a really good idea to just keep that in mind. Yeah, and admittedly, I haven't looked at it in a while because it, it will kind of put you to sleep. Um, <laughs> but there, it's it's very useful. So, so but I can tell you looked at it a few times. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, Over the years. And, and it's marked up in all kinds of colors. <laughs> and uh, I'd also say that in my, because I've also read that point many times, right? <laughs> but the preamble is actually maybe the most instructive part of that rule. Yes, I agree. Right. The response to comments? Yeah, that the, part? yeah. And, and like, because it's like gives you that insight to like, what were people thinking when they were actually thinking? Well, and I think this is a really good point. You all have said it's super dense. You can't sleep, you're going to read it. You haven't looked at it in a while. When we're doing these things, this is the kind of thing that we're up against with trying to get across you know, what is needed and putting it in a very simple way and the government agencies bent over to say, we're not really good at doing that. So, you know, we need to think, we've said it, but we need to keep that at, at that kind of level too. We need to make it as simple as possible so that we understand it, but then also anybody else who's looking at it, you know, whether it's agency or various project proponents, you know, whatever the case may be. So, yeah. So this is something that, I, again, I think we'll, we could come back to yeah. at the end of the summer when yeah. we're producing a report to talk about what kind of products we have. Right. Because we may have tiered products that are like simple guidance Summary. documents that are easy to understand and read and not too dense. And then we the might back. have like background that yeah. actually provides some mm -hmm. support. Right. I mean, one of the reasons we have student support for this is because um, as I was answering to Eric's question, like, so we're gonna be backfilling in and and collecting data, collecting papers, we might have data on different things. And so at some point we'll have like, hopefully, at least for some of these, we'll have you know a good amount of scientific evidence to support mm -hmm. a particular position, but that is not something that we're gonna to wanna to put in all that detail in this report, because right. it'll be super long and nobody will be able to read it. So, uh, so we'll have to think about yeah, I think the website would be helpful that too to direct people to the one place. Okay, cool. All right, so let's, uh, with that, let's get into um, some definitions. So, uh, Rich, you want to do this or do you want to tag do this or how do you sure. want to do this? I'll do it. Okay, cool. You can add to it. So, so, what we thought actually. Yeah, okay. So what we thought we would do is we would do definitions. This group will know a lot of these things, but we just kind of wanted to have the, you know, everyone have the common understanding. 
Plus, uh, you'll get a little bit of my perspective on this, and so feel free to add your own perspectives as we go through so that we understand if there's issues or something. So we're talking about mitigation, actions taken to prevent, reduce, or compensate for impacts to resources. And um, as we mentioned with, uh, with what Christine asked, you know, we're focusing on compensation. So compensatory mitigation is replacement of resources lost to some impact. And then full compensation requires replacement of all resources. And so the idea is we, you know, we're going to have this equivalency. We'll talk about this later. But you know, the goal is to have whatever the amount of lost be balanced by the amount of gain. And we'll talk about that in a second. And so we have this policy goal of no net loss. And that in my career in mitigation has expanded over time. So at first was no net loss of acres, right? And then it became no net loss of acres and functions. And now it's no net loss of acres, functions, and services. Um, interesting, talking about the 2008 mitigation rule, my memory of the rule and my understanding of the way mitigation is mostly dealt with is services mostly are not dealt with. But I actually went back to the rule and services are definitely in the rule. So there's a lot of stuff and actually the what's written in there, I think is really quite um, insightful. It's just that I don't think it's actually oper operationalized very much. And so I think lots of times now we're still, when we do an assessment of whether we achieve no net loss, it's still area for the most part, but it should be all these things. And then in my ideal, every project should end up with no net loss, but that's not really the way it works. And so when that policy goal is assessed, typically it's by a program. So it might be for the whole United States or it's for the state or something like that. Um, so we're not really expecting every project necessarily to have no net loss. Okay, so we have in-kind versus out-kind. So the, these are fuzzy <laughs> distinctions, but in-kind are actions that focus on restoring or replacing as closely as possible the resource that was damaged by the impact. So if you have impacts to a wetland, you restore a wetland or you create a wetland and then that's in-kind. Out-of-kind mitigation is actions that focus on restoring or replacing resources that differ from the damaged resources. So you might have damage to soft bottom habitat and, um, but your restoration or your mitigation is to restore or create a weapon. And then, um, and this is, you know, the crux of what we're gonna be talking about is, so in this out of kind mitigation, to, to achieve the goal of mitigation, you have to have them balance, the loss and the gain balance. And so you have to have some way of saying what, how, men, how much of resource A has to be created in order to compensate for the loss of resource B. And that's going to be you know, our main challenge. So Rich, uh, yeah. the mitigation rule says that pretty much what you're saying, except instead of just saying resource, it says um, it, it, it hinges on structural and functional type. So it actually, so it references resources, whether it's in kind or out of kind, but it actually goes on and talks about structural so they, they, they reference structures and functions, which is good. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, then the other aspect that, of mitigation that we want to focus on this project is on-site versus off-site. So on-site is mitigations occurring at or very near the site of impact. Off-site is mitigations occurring away from the site of impact. And so um, when we're talking, I'm going to define some of these other terms too, but when we talk about permittee responsible mitigation, it could be either on site or off site. When we talk about third party mitigation, it's almost always off site. And so we can think of this two by two in terms of, you know, in kind versus out of kind and on site and off site. And so traditionally, and certainly when I started thinking about mitigation, the preferred type of mitigation would be the same type, so in kind, same type of resources that were impacted and on site, so happening in the same place, or at least as near as possible to the same place. Um, Spencer, when he was putting in his plug for the 2008 mitigation rule, 
was mentioned in mitigation banks, and so now the preference is this in-kind but off-site, and not really because they're off-site, but because they're third-party mitigation, so either mitigation banks or in-lieu fee programs. And then when we have um, out-of-kind, you know, we have some sort of substitute resources there, and they could have been on-site or off-site, but, um, and actually, maybe you guys who deal with the regulations can tell me how often it happens on-site, because all the cases that I can think of, when it's out of kind, it's off site. But maybe once in a while there's out of kind that's on site. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and in the policy as a policies as I understand them, there doesn't seem to be a really big preference for on site versus off site when you're talking about out of kind um, mitigation. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lauren mentioned Nexus, so I wanted to mention Nexus too. So that's the degree to which there's a linkage between the impact and the mitigation. And so um, that has to do with how similar the resources lost and gained are and how close they are in space and time. And so again, this is like a, a you know, there's not a, a clear, obvious number to apply to a nexus, but you know, if it's in kind on site, it clearly has a close nexus to the impacts. And if it's out of kind and off site, it has a looser nexus. And so, um, especially when we're brainstorming about potential components for, um, for out of kind mitigation, we do have to keep in mind what, that there have, should be some nexus. And um, I don't expect to get this from this group, but you know, an example of out of kind mitigation for impacts to fish would be, you know, an educational program, you know, on this Amok Pier or something like that, which actually might, you know, might work, but okay. you have to make sure that there actually is some kind of nexus there that would make it appropriate mitigation. And so that's, this is definitely going to be, you know, something that we'll be looking at when we're evaluating uh, our ideas. Yeah. Say that your example that you just gave is a perfect example because well, how you think of nexus from a functions versus a services perspective is going to be completely yeah. different. Yeah. Exactly. And so this when the structure, so when we're talking about structure, um, then there's you know a certain set of things that might work to produce that structure. When you're talking about functions, it's another set, and when you're talking about services, it's you know a very very different set. And so that's why, um, well, that's why, well, I, don't know, I have a slide on system services, but that's why you know, I'm interested in the services side, which you talked about how you're getting more and more involved with the services. And it definitely changes the things that you think might be appropriate for mitigation. But part of, I think, will the discussion we're gonna have to have about the framework is, can you just mitigate the services? Or do you ha also have to mitigate function or structure or some other elements too? Because if you know if it's you know if it's fishing opportunities, can you just make a fishing reef and then you know and that is the service that was lost because you lost all this fish population and is that sufficient or do you need to worry about the fish productivity or something like that? I think just quickly back up. There's a EPA has a relatively new publication that came out within the last year mm -hmm. on the entire 10 chapters, right, on this very topic. And there's at least one chapter on compensatory mediation and a chapter on restoration that's all about ecosystem services. But it's all about ecosystem services and how do you deal with these issues. Really? Uh, so it I came out of the EPA it. already, um, but I have it on my, I can send it to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, cool. um, oh, you know, we should also set up a research or a, yeah, yeah, folder, yeah, a yeah, folder yeah, or yeah, something yeah. where we put all of these. Yeah, yeah. Bill Ainsley and I wrote the chapter on compensatory mediation, right? It's all about how to deal with ecosystem services. Yeah. So just to be what? clear, when you say the word service, do you also mean ecosystem services or because I, I think we should be I only mean ecosystem services okay, when I'm saying when you said the because when you said the visitor center idea on the end of a pier as a service. Yeah, sorry. You don't mean well. I just want to make well, sure. Actually, that I didn't mean it as like an educational service. Educational service, or it could be. It could be. But as we're talking in this group, when we say service, we should mean ecosystem service 
versus a uh, uh, additional event. Additional event. Yeah, we should. Okay. But ecosystem services is really broad. I have a definition on that. We can come back. No, uh, yeah, I, I realize that it's broad, but the, boy, those are easy ones for people tangible. to pick off and yeah. say, I'll do that. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly that's right. amazing. So that's really the, that is the nexus. So, so the thing is, and again, this and in this report, we'll put the report that we did on non-traditional approaches to mitigation for California. Uh, we we grappled with this problem there too because um, there can be a nexus. So, impacts could result in a loss of educational opportunities, and you could have a learning center to replace those services. But um, again, what I just said to Eric is that is sufficient. You know, is there a strong enough nexus to make, to make that count as mitigation is going to be the, the thing that we have to think about. What maybe just as a placeholder, when we we spent a when we were trying to do the mitigation bank, we spent a significant amount of time figuring out services and functions. And in the end, we didn't we couldn't make them different. I know that by the definition, they are different. But I wonder if there's worth like maybe from Eric's writing or something, spending time on where they would differ or not. Okay. We ended up saying that everything that we listed about an ecosystem function was at the end of the day, something that someone cared about. Right. And that made it an ecosystem service. Yeah, we often used to use that word values, you know, as a transition service. And yeah. I know at the core, when, when um, Dan Smith and her folks were developing, we tried to come up with first, they would go give these examples and they'd say, well, you know, if you have a riverine system, the pond water is part of what it does, but that has a flood control benefit to us. So right. we perceive that benefit. Right. That was our, at that point, we call it a value. Right. But it became mm -hmm. right. a service. Mm -hmm. And so there is a link. Yeah. You know, um, it, can, it can definitely benefit both. That's I think. And, and maybe it be. doesn't matter in practice, but maybe in, I mean, maybe if we address whether it matters. Well, it, it matters in the communication. Right. Yes. Because when people yeah. hear the word, some people think one thing, and then they get upset because you start going down the right thing when you address it. So I think I think being purposeful, um, whether we use these definitions or tweak something, I think definitely a key part of this needs to be de defining what we mean by term X or Y and whatever document we do. I'm going to go right. back to those. Anyone go there again? Yeah, I was just saying. I mean, it's about um, that. So you have this is like the modeling and ecosystem is right. a different approach, but um, but I think one of the big sort of transitions that we've seen is the precursor to this is clearly identifying who the beneficiary of those services are, right? Because how you think about ecosystem services really depends on like who the intended beneficiary of those services are, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's kind of been one of the um, sea changes in kind of the way that we've started to think about services is incorporating that first question, like who is the intended beneficiary, right? And then then going into like how, because these services are a little bit agnostic in terms of, right, they're sort of general, like, yeah. you know. Yeah. Right, so. yeah. Well, they don't, they do not, for right. the, they do not necessarily specify who benefits. Right, exactly. So it's implied in some of them. I mean, recreational services, you know, it's implied yeah. to the people who recreate, right. or the people yeah. who are benefiting. But in order to evaluate so, that, you have to sort of know who the intended beneficiary is. Well, so the point I, the point I was going to make, and based on what Christine said, is that so some of these I think are are really linked to functions, but some of them is it doesn't have multiple services, not so much. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that's so, true. So, um, but maybe even I I was thinking about it in the practical process, like what we spent we got slowed down in this category in the mitigation bank, and maybe that that's if I was trying to think about what was an actionable guidance, it might relate to where the process got confusing mm -hmm. in doing it. And so maybe something that clarifies some some ecosystem services and functions are the same and some are distinguished or mm -hmm. they fall in different categories or we care about them more and whether that matters or not might be a useful note. Yeah. I mean, maybe at the end of the day, it, it didn't matter for us, right? So the reason, so my own personal take, so my, my soapbox about services <laughs> really has to do with mitigation banks. Yeah. And the fact that s services and functions are, totally are not the same in those cases. 
because you can take a function that's happening in one place where the impact is, and there are services associated with that function there, and then you're going to replicate that function up in the upper part of the watershed. So let's say that function is water quality improvement. So that is that function. Sorry, the service is water quality improvement. The, the function is the biogeochemical processing. You can get the biogeochemical processing happening up here, but there's no water quality service up there because the water's already good and there's no people to benefit from it. The context matters. What's that? The context matters. Yeah, anymore. and that's where the, the beneficiaries of the service are really important because the beneficiaries of the service are down here and they're not up there. And so even though the function leads to that service, and, and on one, in one way, they're kind of indistinguishable, but when you move that function, they're not at all the same. So you lose the, so if you, if you replicate this, the function in a different place, you can still have the same functions, but you might not have any service. So just in the 2008, Rule. Maybe, maybe, maybe this might be a point we want to fix. And we'll tell a highlight. We might want to fix. Yeah, yeah. So, so the definition for services here is it means the benefits that human populations receive from functions that occur in ecosystems. Yeah. So if we if we eventually want to advocate for broadening it, I, David Olson at headquarters is the one. So, but I'm fine with that yeah. definition. Okay. Actually, human. It's just that my feeling is that when you replicate the function up in a relatively undisturbed watershed, that you know it's high up in the watershed. There's not water quality problems at that point, and there aren't people to benefit really from it up there. So your the context has changed, and so and, and, the, and the going and that's a very general definition, but the specific you know, human right like. Which communities, which types of yeah. people like yeah. benefit versus if there was an impact in one area, the, the impact might be to a certain population or community, right? But the benefit, if you restore some wealth, might be to a totally different right. 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 population. Yeah, and potentially time period too, right? Yeah. You, you, we're talking about some like like climate shifts and things of that nature. The, the beneficiary might be in 20 years or right, something. Exactly. But you can also flip that in two different directions, right? So you might be reallocating outside of what the area, and maybe it's a, a wealthy, well, yeah. you know, you know, wealthy and healthy population yeah. that's had that impact. But maybe that reallocation of resources goes to a population that hasn't right. had that benefit. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so you can know, look at it going either direction. Yeah. So your yeah. point is super well taken, right? Because you have this really interesting juxtaposition where. Yeah you might functionally be sort of going in one direction, but in your example, from a services perspective, going in the other direction, right? Right. right. So you like, oh, this is functionally a good idea, or maybe it's functionally it's a bad idea, let's say, but from a services perspective, it's a really good idea because you're benefiting a population that's underserved, right? And so you have these really yeah. interesting- Or has a legacy of yeah. having been affected, yeah. but yeah. not have the means right. to yeah. get the restoration in those locations. Yeah. So the so here's a placeholder idea. Is, um, it, it seems to me everything you're saying is is maybe one criteria it should be is that you try and do it first within the community, the impacts are occurring, or at least within the reach of that community before you start jumping outside of the community. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a, a state and the counties all have to do county plans. And those uh, those general plans, and in those general plans, they have to address conservation and open space, which is really weak in almost every general plan. This could be a place where we can help them identify some of those things that they can put into their general plan to make it easier. Right, but I'll just counter that by saying this: I think your point, like especially now that we're spending so much time thinking about other things like traditional, you know, you know indigenous populations and traditional ecological services that those communities have been historically impacted so you might actually if you just look at it from a services perspective you might go you know what we actually do want to transfer those services right, right out of the community right and we're okay with that impact because we're compensating for you know a legacy impact to those other communities right? and in fact you might prefer a project that has less of a functional lift if it had more 
the service right. and tax right. and an underserved community. Right. Right. So I don't think we're saying anything yeah. differently. Yeah. I'm saying you would still look in that local area for that underserved community right. yeah. before you went somewhere else. Right, sure, right. Okay. Great. But I've often thought, you know, it would be really interesting to understand what the geographic distribution of offsite has historically been and how does that then align with you know, underserved mm -hmm. communities or maybe those that have the burden of legacy actions that have not received the mitigation in those areas, right? And you lift broadly. You know the, the resources across our region, and taking that sort of an approach. Sure. And I think it'd be interesting again. And then obviously, it's not our place to make the decision, but I think it's interesting to think about how you set up an assessment approach, right? Mm -hmm. That can account for these different things. And that's what we're hoping to get out in the framework. Yeah. So the so right now we're focusing on the components. So we might focus on services, or we might focus on functions. Mm -hmm. But out of the framework, we're hoping to get out some idea about how we. Combine these things to get what we think is the appropriate mitigation height, amount, location. And it might be a combination of these. Okay, so that so that was our, my definition of services, but obviously there is more to it than that. And then just wanted to talk about permittee responsible versus third party mitigation. So permittee responsible is when the mitigation has been implemented by the permittee or contractor. So the third permittee. permittee. Third party mitigations for mitigation that's undertaken by a party other than the permittee who assumes the responsibility for the permittee's compensatory mitigation requirements in return for a payment. And so we have mitigation banks and in lieu fee programs as examples of third party mitigation. Mitigation banks, you know, new existing or newly created areas available for purchase to fulfill mitigation requirements. There's a, there's a whole process for PEV, well, as Christine was talking about, having gone through the process of establishing mitigation, there's a whole process and, um, you know, different regulatory agency involvement in establishing mitiga mitigation banks. But the idea is once the bank is established, then there's, you know, there's a mechanism set up for, for buying credits that will then, those credits, you know, the, the number of credits that are required is determined by the agency and then the permittee buys those credits and that meets their um, their obligations and then the bank itself has to operate in a way that means that those credits are, are valid or good. In lieu fee mitigation is where the permittee provides funds to some in lieu fee program a sponsor and typically then the money is put in an account designated for mitigation of other resources or or something instead of actually having the permittee mitigate for the impact themselves. We already talked a little bit about structure versus function. This is a really common um, dichotomy, um, both in terms of thinking about impacts and mitigation and also thinking about assessing them. So Eric and I worked on developing CRAM and that was a really big thing. And you know, we we started out thinking about functional assessments, but we realized that functions are things that are processes, biological or, or abiotic processes that happen over time. And we really have a hard time in a rapid assessment. Oh, I think everyone here knows what CRAM is. Okay. California yeah. Rapid Assessment Method. Anyway, yeah. um, in a rapid assessment, you really can't assess extents functions. And so you end up assessing condition um, based on the structure of things that are there. So physical, biological um, features at a particular point in time. Um, we, we assume that there's a relationship between structure and function, and we often think that there, you know, it's a pretty clean relationship. We know that it's actually not necessarily that clean, and you know, there are now you know, potentially a lot of complex relationships, nonlinear relationships, and so you know, this is an example of, so in all of my restoration ecology classes, I think I use this diagram on the left. Anybody who's taken a class with me um, <laughs> saw that diagram. Um, and so, you know, and even this diagram, if you, if you start thinking about it too much, it falls apart. But the general idea is that there would be structure and function happening in some ecosystem. And so you can characterize the ecosystem by some measure of those things. Um, but on the right side is kind of like a different way of looking at it, which is, you know, that ecosystem 
might have all sorts of different states, alternative stable states that would have different types of structure and function. Right? So it's not necessarily so simple. Talked about ecosystem services. I mentioned this just as briefly as a, as a comment before. You know, there's different ways that we can focus both, you know, our thinking and our assessments of impacts and, and mitigation. So we can have habitat or community focused mitigation. So the idea is to change the structure and function sort of at a system level. And um, yeah, so, uh, and the, the alternative is we can have species focused where then we're paying attention to species abundances and we're focused on trying to make sure that the species abundances is sort of uh, meet the amount needed for the impact. So. And then maybe this is finally, um, so we've talked about equivalency and the issues with out of kind mitigation in characterizing when you have the equivalent amount of resources for what was lost. And um, a few things in here. So the, the one way that um, often we try to make sure that we get equivalency is we have these offsetting ratios or mitigation ratios. And that is, that can be used for a whole bunch of reasons, but one of the reasons is to account for uncertainty. So um, we didn't put this in here, but there's, you know, there's uncertainty at every stage of this, right? So there's uncertainty in determining what the impacts are. There's uncertainty in determining what the mitigation is gonna um, produce. There's uncertainty about what the mitigation actually does produce after you've constructed it. And so, um, and so one of the things that we should be thinking about is how do we deal with this uncertainty? So, you know, we could do ratios or we could do other sorts of things. We could do modeling, we could do different things to try to make sure that um, in the end, when, especially when we're talking about out of time mitigation, that the amount of mitigation is equivalent to what the losses were. Oops. Okay. And so that was it for my definitions. Anybody have any other thoughts or comments? Well, Rich, you know full well that we worked on this mitigation ratio setting checklist to try to get at some of these things like on-site, off-site, um, or uh, in-kind, out-of-kind. If you have a function or condition assessment method or you just need some qualification, what's the risk of uncertainty? Um, are you losing area or just function? And so, not that that like is the end all be all, but what it was what was good about that exercise was just trying to figure out what are the factors that you consider in compensatory mitigation and deciding you have certain impacts. How do you compensate for those impacts, whether it's on site, off site, out of time, in kind, et cetera? And um, we've had varying levels of success in using that silly thing, frankly, um, <laughs> because it's, you know, we. The numbers in there, when you look at it, it's like some of those numbers, it's like, it's just voodoo, frankly. Um, you know, they, we came up with numbers to come up with similar mitigation ratios that we came up with historically. We didn't want to be completely outrageous. And so Dan Swenson was a big driver of that. Um, Rich knows all about it. Um, it has certainly has worked opportunities to improve, but what was good about it is it got people thinking especially practitioners, like in the core, people who don't normally look at these things, who really think like, oh, like it's just a very <coughs> protocol-driven thing. Like you look at this, you look at this, you might value things differently, but it's pres pretty prescriptive and like you have to look at these things and cooking up your mitigation ratio. Um, so I think that would be worth actually putting, making available to the group because yeah. So to me, it's like, it's structured decision-making, right? right? So it structures, there's all these decisions that go into making a final decision about mitigation. And this just makes sure that everybody follows the same thoughts, even though they might necessarily, not necessarily always come up with exactly the same number, 
um, but it's, try, it's giving guidance about what number you should choose. Um, and so I think that is useful and it's, it is something that we, I think will, again, like in the framework, we'll need to think about how whatever we come up with in terms of the different components are put together. And so that was why that we had this uncertainty thing is that that's one element of whatever we come up with, we have to also think about the uncertainty in terms of making the assessments that we're going to do. And the other, this is specifically maybe compiling and resources and like you said, we've asked. So in the SFA area, right, they have the RIG, which kind of has some of the elements and stuff. FA Restoration Regulatory Integration Team, mm -hmm. I got that right, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the interagency work group that was convened by this group like a uh, local initiative, like a local body, I guess, proposition or something. Mm -hmm. Anyways, but they exist specifically to do regulatory integration on coastal, you know, mitigation projects, right? So that's BCDC, the I think the commission, no, just BCDC, BCDC, the core EPA, yeah, the, the department, sure. right? But they sit together to, and but they've actually, I think, really thought through a lot of these issues, like uh, what are, you know, they have these, what they call salmon and deer issues, right? Like that, like are become impediments to making these decisions. And they started to sort of think about like, how do we overcome some of these issues? So that, and it's just, you know, taking advantage of some interagency sure. dialogue that's occurred, right? Cool. Yeah, that would be useful. So. Okay. Cool. Um, we're going to break in a few, I sent Sam to get the sandwiches, so we'll break in a few minutes, but, um, but just before then, maybe um, just a couple, uh, a couple guidance things as we, as we start to turn our mind to more direct brainstorming um, type of things and things you might want to consider. Um, just especially this first bit in particular, right, um, trying to throw out, so, so these, these are suggestions from um, just design companies that designs new products and stuff. But I think I think there, there's some value, a lot of value in these in, in this level of participation for these types of groups. But basically, um, uh, somebody throws something up and we can comment on it, but let's maybe not like knock it down as the very first step, you know, kind of thing. Uh, add to the conversation as opposed to sort of take away basically. Um, and um, and this is, this is the part of our meeting that, that's the most sort of kind of a little bit changed from how we originally conceived of it. We thought we would have like twice the amount of people here so we break up into a small group. Obviously, we're, 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 we don't need to do that uh, with the number of folks in the, in the physical room here, so that's cool. So we'll do these things as, as a, you know, this is our small group. We are, we are essentially a small group right here. Um, but uh, so I, 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 like how, I like how we've been doing this so far, like talking to myself, pausing, getting ideas. Um, but this is this is now sort of the time to start to pivot to actually just start to jot stuff down on the whiteboard and just start to be a, a, a general um, flurry of ideas. So again, um, probably about 20 minutes we'll break for lunch. So if you need to hit, hit the bathroom right now, you can, but in a few minutes we'll be able to break. And let me just check in with, uh, if, any, if anybody's still yeah, online. I don't, I don't think anybody's probably at left. Oh, Pete, Pete, the, Pete the man is still here. Pete is still here. Oh. So, uh, so Pete, we haven't heard from you. Maybe we'll take a pause right here. So, any any thoughts about that stuff we've been chiming in, uh, like definitions or or other general stuff that you wanted to? Uh, maybe we talked over you or or something. Wild Pete? Ideas. I, we want wild no, ideas. No, I'm good. I'm good. I I would have said something if I had anything to add. Okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, it looks like Josh signed back on and wrote a few questions and thoughts. Oh, can you, can you, can you? <laughs> it's like, like, light the dynamite, throw it, and then leap. That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so the first one was, uh, are we covering compensatory litigation under CWA and Port of Cologne and ESA CSEP question? We'll add it to the list. Add yeah. List. yeah. Um, with all the deference to the uh, conservation needs of marine and inland resources, A, not B, very important and relevant focus is the SL, SLR transition zone, where land use change will intensify over coming decades and suggest a strong nexus with SLR adaptation. So this is something that, no, not that specifically, but just that triggers a general 
idea that has also been raised already today, which is in the past, we've treated the world as stationary when we made mitigation decisions for the most part, and now we know it's not. And so even, so I'm, Pete and I are involved in this Poseidon mitigation project down in South San Diego Bay, and, and we definitely have incorporated sea level rise in the planning for that project, which is great. We're still grappling with how that's going to affect the assessment, but I think we've got like a philosophically reasonable approach to how we're going to do that. Um, but haven't really figured it to like credits. Um, we, we have talked about resiliency here and we'll talk some more about that, but you know, it's like um, there might be more value given to mitigation done in particular places, like places that are going to be affected by mm -hmm. sea level rise and mm -hmm. ways that you can get resiliency to sea level rise. That have, might have more value than mm -hmm. other places. I don't think we've really incorporated that in our mitigation. Uh, so I, and I want to build on that because I loved your definition of coastal when you put it up, right? And so in thinking about the sea level rise issue, it started, and so let's just throw jurisdictional definitions out the window, right? Because we know every agency has a different definition, and clearly we know they're, you know, given the recent Supreme Court case as of today, right? Yeah. We know there's, there, that they, they, they change all Wait, the time. What happened today? The, the Sackett decision went against the core, right? So, uh -huh. yeah, so that was pretty, pretty good. So we're at this point. So, so all this rulemaking, <laughs> which we knew, right. so they were rolling out training, Think, okay, everybody get trained up. And then, I mean, I was like, why bother? It's, it's like, like we knew, we knew so it. As of this know. morning, the Supreme Court threw that out, right? Yeah. And, and restricted the core definition of the program. So Supreme Court now the time it has it's to be continuously <laughs> and yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, right. okay. yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I was reading it because I'm like, oh my and God, this thing. But I don't want to get into that. But, but my point was is that when we think about out of time, right? So I, it's kind of a different. So so we sort of think out of time because it's different wetland type, but really going to Rich's point, right? If you think of the coastal zone as one sort of continuous sort of resource Agreed. type, right? Agreed. From you know the near shore to the transitional zones, then maybe it's not really out of time. It's just different components of one time, right? And it is just a different way of thinking about, it, right? Because it's it is dynamic, right? And so what is you know today's dunes might be tomorrow's wetlands, or you know things like that. And and also there even even as applied traditionally in China out China it's a gray area there yeah. and on site off site is the gray right. area there too right. there's, yeah. there's grades of how much and so I when in my introduction I talked about the San Diego wetland rest mitigation project being out of time for fish level but it's actually partially in time right. also because yeah. yeah. some of those fish levy actually benefit from mm -hmm. being in that yeah. environment so. I think, yeah, we we don't have to have like really strict black and white rules. <laughs> and we wrestled with it a tiny bit too because of buffer and connectivity functions. We defined the functions, but then when we went to go give credit for it, I think it's Coastal Commission that can't give credit for buffer mm -hmm. yeah. if it's upland technically. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's there, and we talked about it, and then there was like an idea that we would like it to be there, but then at the end of the day, all those acres were cut out. Functional ecosystem and jurisdictional ecosystem are different. Totally different. Yeah, That's so, so I, I, I think for the purpose of today and talking about this stuff, to be sure we want to be cognizant of agencies' um, uh, constraints or priorities or whatever, but that's today's not the day to worry about the priorities, right? Today is the day to just like broadly coast or, or broadly performance. Like, like that's what we want to think about, um, you know, today and tomorrow. And then over the course of summer, we can work on adjusting things if that if that's really appropriate or that's that's too much but but this should, i think for today we shouldn't be we shouldn't be bound by um a geographic region or specific constraint and i think that's that's one of the more challenging things i think because we're all used to our experience in a wetland or in a sandy beach or whatever and and of course we're going to draw upon that but really you know coastal sage scrub kelp forest right i mean I, I, like the, what we're trying to get to at, at this this phase are, are principles and approaches that have value and speak to wherever we're talking about on the, on the on the broadly writ coastal zone. And then yes, there might be some particular flavors that get enacted in context X, but let's not be overly prescriptive and, and, and 
narrow the starboard. But maybe maybe what comes out as an action item in the framework is where the conflict lets you not put in the philosophy or something. Mm -hmm. Not as you can't talk about it, but the points to change or function or definitions to better do so that you can enact on it. Yeah, and that's, that's and like that, your action list when you come up with the after this document, where do you take it next? Yeah, because and that's also why well, it's not on here, but, but so that's also why we wanted to focus on the sort of middle tier, right? Because the framework that plays into the framework and the metrics are very specific how we're measuring it. But like, that's why we kind of want to start in this kind of middle of the pack um, that should be, if productivity is a thing, productivity should matter wherever, right? And, and it might be expressed or interpreted or, 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 measured. or measured in a different way. But there is this aspect of this natural system that is, if we, if we think it's important, it's probably important for all these systems, or at least many, many systems. Cool. And that's also in, when we do the case studies in the next phase of the project. Well, exactly. Certainly get more into those potential regulatory constraints. Yeah. constraints. Yeah, absolutely. I will say, uh, as somebody who's worked with the Corps of Engineers for a long time, we got very advice of all the multi DOD experimentation for the Corps. Hmm. And so we have. <laughs> um, but there are functions and services being provided. It was an area that was heavily invested um, talent and whether or not to do that. Um, there were tribal issues out there, so we, we worked through those, but um, we are awarding credit there. And I've worked on coastal restoration projects where we recognize um, that there are pollinators and pathways that are important, mm -hmm. and that you are going to have transgression over mm -hmm. the sea level rise. And so those are all creditable areas. And so I can, I can tell you, at least from a core standpoint, we're flexible. And I certainly welcome all agencies uh, to, to recognize that, that, that these, these systems don't respect <laughs> political yeah, exactly. boundaries, basically. Totally. It's like totally. they, they function or they don't. Totally. And so totally. they function over that landscape. And that, that landscape does. Yeah, completely. Um, okay, cool. Well, it might not be the exact best time to start brainstorming since the food's going to be here in a couple minutes. So maybe we just um, pause here and, and rather than start the brainstorming before lunch, maybe we'll, we'll start after lunch. And so, um, so with that, uh, Pete, you're welcome to stay, but, but you're good unless you wanted to uh, throw out any potential things you wanted us to hear about um, uh, before, you, uh, before you disappear. No, I'm good. Thanks, Sean, though. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Pete. Uh, appreciate it. And um, I will kill the Zoom and we'll just take a few minutes. And then when the food arrives, we can we can start eating. Oh, so, so Pete was the last one on the line? Pete, Pete was the last the last one standing. Actually, amazing. 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 Yeah. Unbelievable. I, I would not have guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> the last one on the line. <laughs> 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 I was the first one. How did you learn about that?